Thank you very much, Susie, and welcome to everyone joining us this evening. I'm Florence Eshlomi. I'm the MP for Vauxhall, and really excited to be hosting this event and chairing this event this evening. We've got a range of fantastic four speakers, and because of timings and one of our speakers has to duck out quickly, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Steve Bryan MP. He's the former Parliamentary Undersecretary for Public Health and Primary Care. He will give us some opening remarks and a presentation, and then I'll introduce the other three speakers. Over to you, Steve. Thanks very much, Florence. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me loud and clear. You can, excellent. Um, look, I can't promise you Lady Gaga um, or even <laughs> Garth Brooks, but uh, I promise to say a few words at the opening of this latest uh, Big Tent event. And uh, it's a happy day on many levels. So um, I, I could sing, oh, happy day, but I'll refrain. Um, I do have to duck out, as Florence says. Um, obviously, there are some other serious matters going on. I've got to deal with something constituency-wise, but I will duck back in. Um, but before, before that, and to sort of try and set the scene, I mean, it was sort of back in 2019, you remember when the world was normal. Um, we, we committed to ending new cases of HIV by 2030. And I, and I say we because, you know, as the then public health minister, the prime minister gave me the opportunity to put what bluntly had become scientifically possible, ending new cases of HIV, we chose 2030, into government policy. Um, you know, I was... I was in the second year of secondary school in 1986 when Don't Die of Ignorance landed and those adverts hit the television and the leaflets hit all of our doormats. And it was a terrifying moment. And, you know, like many young lads growing up in rural Hampshire, I, I would have been forgiven for thinking this wasn't my problem. Um, this, was a, this was a problem that affected gay men, right? Um, it was a problem that that wasn't anything to do with me. And then some many, many years later, I found myself in the Department of Health as the public health minister with the ability to do something about this. And I per when I first proposed the idea to Matt Hancock, I really was pushing an open door. And, and in pretty short order, we were standing behind the, uh, alongside the Elton John AIDS Foundation and, and all the assembled HIV family that I had got to know and and loved during my time in office to declare that this government would sign up to the ambitious, yeah, I, I think, thought and still think, highly achievable goal. But even the, the scientifically possible as government policy is, is not enough, and uh, we needed a practical plan to meet the goal. So along came brilliant Ian and Terence Higgins Trust, the National AIDS Trust and, and, and the Elton John AIDS Foundation, and together they set up the HIV Commission. And uh, I, I was thrilled to be asked to join, not least because I <laughs> left office by then. Um, the B word had struck and I, and I decided to leave, leave the government. So it's very rare to, to start something in government and then get a chance to finish it outside. So when I was asked by Ian and the team to be part of the commission, it was an easy, an easy answer, to be honest. Uh, and we were tasked with one, one question how can we end new HIV cases in England by 2030? So after a, a big national conversation with healthcare professionals, with, with councils, with HIV bodies and charities and people living with HIV, of course, the final report of the commission came out on World AIDS Day on, on the 1st of December in the middle of, a, of another uh, pandemic. And you know, our, our contention is that we absolutely can end new HIV cases in England by 2030, be the first country in the world to do it. And our final report clearly sets out how we think we can do that. Uh, but it will take a, a step change, um, a change in belief and resources and significant government action if we're going to do it. Just uh, three, three key points really from it. It requires new targets. So an 80% reduction by 2025. And that's important to us because we wanted to be able to see staging point progress instead of just getting to 2030 and then the government turning around and saying, ah, there's been a problem. Um, reporting to Parliament uh, on progress by the Cabinet Office and Department of Health, that is absolutely critical so that we can, uh, opposition MPs and backbench MPs like me, uh, we can measure the government, hold its feet to the fire on, on those targets. And, and most important of all was to normalise HIV testing through the NHS. You know, no longer, we felt, should people leave a sexual health clinic without being offered a test. 
you know, when people present to A&E, they register at a GP or the NHS is otherwise taking blood for all, all manner of reasons. Um, they're all key opportunities to test. And all too often we feel they're opportunities that are missed. And um, we can't afford to miss any opportunities if we're going to reach this goal. The maternity testing is a, is a sort of shining example of, of mass HIV testing working very successfully. You know, almost 100% of expected mums tested these days, which has led to almost no babies being born with HIV in England. We know it can be done. Um, I'm pleased to say the government has shown that it is true to its word and, and, we, and they've made huge commitments to see our commission direct what now happens in HIV prevention and treatment and policy. The Prime Minister backed our commission's vision wholeheartedly. The Chancellor of the Exchequer endorsed the report on the floor of the House of Commons the day that it was launched. The, Michael Gove, the Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster, the Cabinet Office Secretary, um, spoke actually at our launch and, and promised this annual reporting to Parliament on on the 2030 goal, which was really, really important. Um, and then, of course, Health Secretary Matt Hancock accepted the need for the new targets, the 80% by 2025, and promised to increase HIV testing and, and produce and, and publish an HIV action plan by the summer of this year. Um, and, and we will hold him to that. I, I held an adjournment debate in the House on, on World AIDS Day, and Matt, as the Secretary of State, responded to that adjournment debate. And any of you who know Westminster, Obviously, Florence uh, does well. It is very rare for a uh, Secretary of State to respond to an adjournment debate. And I think that shows you, and I know it shows you, uh, how seriously Matt takes this issue. And, and it meant a great deal that he did that. So, you know, th this is where I just want to conclude my remarks. What does the action plan need to do? Well, I think it could do a lot worse than cut, copy and paste our findings into the first draft of the HIV action plan. Um, and we'll be pressing it to do that. NHS England got to come up with a plan to normalise testing across the 16 services identified by that commission. Everything from A&E wards to gender clinics and registering at GP stuff or going for routine smear test. Um, we need to pave a way for HIV prevention drug PrEP, uh, the wonder drug, to be available outside of sexual health services. And PrEP needs negotiating into the GP core contract. Uh, it's not easy to negotiate things to the GP contract that I know as a former primary care minister. Um, and then that becomes a service available at community pharmacies and offered under the newly created patient group direction. So I, I would say this, as a minister, I was, I was very honoured to be able to put this ambition into government policy. And that was the easy bit. Um, as an HIV commissioner, I, it, 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 there's a lot of hard work, um, led by Dame Inga Beale, who's the chairman of the commission, uh, to give that policy a practical plan. Um, and in comparison to what we now have ahead of us, that was easy bit too. Uh, to, together, what we now need to do is to buy into this. Uh, we need to leave the cynicism at the door. Uh, we need to come together. And, you know, we, we work united in Parliament on this subject, where Streety, the Labour MP, and I were both on the commission. Um, we did all the media together on the day of the launch of the plan um, that, that, that the politicians had to do. And we are as one on this. So, you know, whatever, whatever happens in Westminster, change of government or otherwise, this, this will continue. And I think together we need to work, work and, and make the plan a reality. And I, and I know we can do it. I know we can do it if we work together. It's an absolutely wonderful opportunity that we've, we've been given as a community. And uh, let, let's grab it. Let's grab it with both hands as per the, the spirit of the day. Back to you, Florence, and I'll catch up with you shortly. Thank you very much for that, Steve. And just to see that there is that um, commitment from right at the top of the government is really something that will help this commission get life so that we can get those recommend recommendations um, enacted. Um, just before I introduce our next set of speakers, I thought it would be helpful to just do a little bit more scene setting. So as the MP for Vauxhall in South London, I represent the area which has the highest prevalence of people living with HIV in London. And I think, you know, probably in the UK as well. And I also represent a very diverse community I was struck by the statistics um, on World AIDS Day where it was estimated that there are 100, over 105,000 people in the UK living with HIV. And of those 105,000 people, over 6,700 do not know that they are HIV positive. The other thing that struck me about some of those figures was that of the people who are HIV positive, over 1,500 of them are heterosexual. And in 2019, 37% of those people were black African men and women. 
The other statistic that's quite important is that why is it that every year over 250,000 people leave a sexual health clinic without getting the HIV test? And it's fantastic that we've seen so many people committing to the commission, but to see that, to see the recommendations actually enacted and to see us committing to having zero um, rates by 2030, it needs everybody from all different backgrounds, from all different groups, the experts, the community groups working on this. And it's not just about funding, it's about that education, which I think is so important. It's about educating the next generation. It's about educating our young people. It's about educating our diverse community, people where English isn't their first language. Mm. And we've got a range of speakers this evening who are going to give us their highlight and their take on how we can address these really important issues. And um, they'll all bring their own different perspective from their expertise. And I hope that will give us some cause in terms of the Q&A later on. So I'll introduce our first speaker tonight, and that is Dr. Sean Pereira, who is a GP from Lloyd's Pharmacy Online, and a lot of expertise in terms of getting people in terms of sexual health, Lloyd's Pharmacy Online doctor, and he's been associate medical doctor there for over 10 years, and he's worked in the NHS specifically looking at um, HIV medicine. So over to you, Sean. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, nice to see all you guys. I mean, I could talk about um, HIV testing and the report probably for hours, but you'll be glad to hear that I'm going to keep it succinct. So we've got more time for discussion and Q&As at the end. Mm. Um, but yeah, I know Steve's gone now, but fantastic to hear about his journey and the impetus that it's created. Um, as he so eloquently said, I think this is an opportunity and we do need to work together to make this plan a reality. And I am confident, as I'm sure all of you are, that we can end new HIV transmissions by 2030. I do believe that we're in a new phase of the response um, that we've had so far. So one of the main messages from the HIV Commission report is to test, test and test. And apart from the obvious, what does this actually tell us? Well, for me, it, it tells us that this is a time for action. Um, so this, the report sets out really ambitious yet achievable ways to end HIV transmission. But now really is the time to put this back into practice. So what are the next steps? Well, um, as Florence has stated, I've got lots of jobs. I'm actually a clinician working in the NHS. I'm a GP at the front line. I'm also a specialty doctor in sexual health and HIV medicine. And I've also been working as the associate medical director for a digital health provider. So I've got a variety of hats and I've also been involved with various charitable projects and have a research background which is focused on HIV testing and increasing testing in various settings, including primary care. So right through from policy through to clinical practice within each of these roles, I really have seen the opportunities as well as the challenges that we face. And I think if we're to find the estimated 5,900 undiagnosed people living with HIV, the reality is that it's actually more than about test, test, test. It's actually an intricate network of a host of factors. So resource, equity, innovation, stigma, to mention a few. And these factors are interrelated. And I think they're so interrelated that if they're not all addressed to some extent, we will find that they will hold back efforts to end HIV transmission at some point in this journey up to 2030. So I believe the next steps are true collaboration, not just working strategically across stakeholders, but actually navigating what the report refers to as a fragmented health and care system and actually securing appropriate resource. And I feel quite strongly about this. I think the report highlights leadership is essential and so is an agile response. People aren't static. Behaviors and patterns of transmission change and our health and care system also changes as we've seen recently with COVID. And if there's anything COVID has taught us, we need to be ready and able to respond. So there are, there are factors that pervade all our efforts. And if we're to significantly upscale testing across settings. I personally feel that a key hindrance is accountability for delivery of testing and basically who pays for it. Through my own personal attempts to roll out localized opt-out testing in primary care, I've always relied on with my team, charitable donations and pharma sponsorships. And I don't think we should have to rely on these funding streams. 
it really saddens me that the innovation is there, the enthusiasm is palpable, the commitment is evident, yet many of us still struggle. And I think it calls for a national approach to investment. And finally, you'd be glad to hear, um, one of the key messages that I think the, the report highlights and my contention is that one size doesn't fit all. So as Florence has already alluded to, one size is definitely not the answer. COVID has accelerated the digitization of services and it's also changed people's health seeking behaviors. And with the rising popularity and demand, the case for digital as a key channel in upscaling testing has never been stronger. So let's give people options. Let's unpack the needs of these subpopulations and let, let's not only make every contact count, but let's increase that contact and let's increase testing. And together, I believe by doing that, we can achieve our goal. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sean. Test, test, test. And let's make that a reality for so many people who still don't come forward. We know that there's still so much stigma around this. Our next speaker is Michelle Ross and Michelle has been is the founder of Clinic U, a, a director of wellbeing and counselling and sexual services. She's also a board member of IRGT, which is a global trans network for women advocating for trans women's issues on international HIV response. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm just pick up on something that Sean said. I'm, I'm going to try and keep this short too. I'll do my best because once I start chatting, I can go on a bit. However, I feel like I've been talking about HIV prevention forever. It's not forever, but it is 33 years. That was either when I started in the helpline for 27 years or as a psychotherapist, but in the latter nine years, focused on trans people and not just people that turn up at our clinic service uh, when we run that. Um, but ever, what's really important is how do we reach people that are not trans? How do we reach people that don't come to our clinics? How, how do we reach people from beyond the 250,000 people that leave a clinic without a test or the 300,000 that refuse to have a test as well? So how do you reach those people? And I love talking to the sector around HIV sector and sexual health. And, and yet often I feel like when I'm talking to the no, I'm talking to the people that know these issues. And I really want to focus on people that we don't talk to, people that we need to reach out to, and the people that are often termed as hard to reach. Now, for many years, and still, trans people are seen as hard to reach. Now, I did have some notes on my iPad, but it's just disappeared, so I'll carry on. Anyway, um, and I don't see trans people as hard to reach at all. In fact, I see them as not hard to reach when you know where to look. And I think that applies to other people as well, people who are not trans, who don't access sexual health services in the way that many cis cis gay men and men who have sex with men might access sexual health services because um, many of the um, heterosexual women that I speak to don't relate to those kind of services and would rather have something in a community setting. So how do we make community settings much more about HIV testing? And actually, a lot of the women I know and some of the heterosexual cis men don't even think about HIV till I bring it up. It's not on their radar. It's not somewhere that they need to take care of. So how do we make it so that people do think about HIV, that people do start um, engaging with that? So what I'm going to ask, yeah, I've got some questions. Um, so for 30 years, there was no data on HIV and trans people. And the work that we did at Clinic U with Public Health England brought about data from 2015 to 2017. And what came out of that was 123 trans people were accessing HIV care throughout England mainly, because um, this was about Public Health England and who attended that and the services within England. And we know when we looked further, it, it ended up being 178 trans people accessing um, HIV care. 
Now, some people say that might it's not a lot of trans people. Well, actually, it's one too many for me. And um, we didn't even know that amount of people HIV positive within the communities as trans people. And often, trans people don't want to talk about HIV. There's enough stigma around being trans. Being trans and living with HIV kind of puts you out of the dating program. And um, so the question is, how do you collect data on trans people? And are you, is your service, if you run a service, culturally competent for trans, non-binary and gender queer people? And how do you capture that data? How do you capture the, the people that are having tests, that are not having tests, and the issues related to living with HIV and trans people? And, um, you know, I work, I work internationally a lot, especially before lockdown, but I do international conferences online as well. And um, until we had this data, people used to say, you know, UK is a high income country. Why is there no data on trans people? living with HIV, well, now we have it. And we know now there's a real good um, parallel with um, viral suppression and regular use of ARTs. And it's equal to, and actually it's slightly above the data that we have on uh, cis people accessing, using ARTs to suppress HIV. Um, so my question to you as well is, how are trans people having sex? acquiring HIV rather, who are trans people having sex with and who is not testing? You don't have to answer now, but I'm just saying. So um, many of them, we used to run outreach services at sex on premises for trans people and that ended when lockdown started and COVID appeared. And um, many of the men identify as heterosexual. They have sex with trans women but they identify as heterosexual. And they wouldn't go to a sexual health service. They wouldn't go to a clinic. They wouldn't, they had knew nothing about PrEP, knew nothing about PEP. So we started talking to them about it and they started testing within the sexual health, within um, the sex on premises places. And we tested quite a lot of heterosexual identified men. And so men will test heterosexual identified men who are attracted to trans women and believe me there's about a hundred for one trans woman and that's no exaggeration so they will test and it's how you reach communities like that how you can reach people that don't usually engage and if they did go to a sexual health service would not say that they've had penetrative anal sex because they identify as um, heterosexual so how do we reach people like that and how do we reach um other people, heterosexual people, that do not see HIV as part of who they are, part of their needs. So ending HIV by 2030, I'm all behind that, fully behind it. I think there's quite a lot we need to do within those 10 years. No, it's 11, nine years now, isn't it? Um, how long have I gone on for? I can stop. Should I stop? Okay, I'll stop. There you go. Thank you very much, Michonne. Again, some really interesting questions that we should definitely pick up in the wider Q&A session. But I think what you highlighted there in terms of the data, without that data, we can't address the issue. So it's so important that we do know how many people aren't being included in that mass testing. So really, really important there. Thank you. Um, our final speaker this evening is Taku Makua, and he's the head of health improvement programs at Terence Higgins Trust and the founder of Black Men's Health. And Taku has been a strong advocate for HIV prevention and treatment across the Black African communities for over a decade now. And a range of big issues where we're looking at HIV testing online, including click and collect. So it'd just be really good to get his, his take on, on this really important issue. Over to you. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Oh, good, brilliant. Yeah, so um, I think, um, I want to be like that student in class who says, oh, everyone has said what I wanted to say, and then we end it there, but I, I won't. So, <laughs> but um, like the main thing probably that I want to just uh, sort of bring to attention uh, for our thinking about going to, uh, to, to end HIV in England by 2030 is that we've had sort of uh, a good sort of 10 years to some extent. 
I know it's got challenges, but we've had drastic changes in the past 10 years. So um, it is important that we acknowledge that uh, from the latest uh, Public Health England report, uh, cases amongst Black African uh, heterosexuals dropped by 67% from, 20, from 2010. That is big. Um, I know if you then pick the, the, the uh, sort of uh, the peak time, which was for, uh, a peak time for gay men, which was 2014, um, where it dropped uh, uh, like uh, by for, about about 48 percent for gay men as well, like uh, in the um, in, within these last 10 years. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, for Black Africans as well, from 20 uh, from 2014 itself, it also dropped by 48 percent. So things the trends are actually moving sort of in the right direction are they moving fast enough probably not uh we want things to move much faster uh it took a long time for us to get prep uh like and that's sort of to some extent maybe slowed down what we really needed uh to actually uh to accelerate uh, the process of us ending hiv by 2030. so um i just wanted to highlight this because i think uh it raises very interesting questions, uh, particularly when you're looking at the Black African figures. Um, the Black African figures focus on the Black African heterosexuals. And um, it's quite good that I say Black African, but the reality is when you go into the PhD reports, it then breaks it down and say, well, they are from Zimbabwe, they are from Zambia, they are from all these countries. And I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, and I'll tell you the truth, most of the times when I engage with people, I've got lots of friends from other countries, uh, like, from in, 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 like in this country, but I engage with the Zimbabwean community a lot. So it is useful to you guys to see us as Black African, but I am Zimbabwean, you get what I mean? So <laughs> uh, one of our challenges is actually understanding um, our communities better. So the numbers for Black Africans of the number of Black Africans who were first diagnosed in the UK in 2019 was 380. I expect this number is going to be going down and down and down over time. So from 2015, when uh, the, like our PHE started measuring the number of first diagnosed in the UK, that number of first diagnosed Black Africans in the UK has dropped by 43%. So the trends are, <laughs> with time, that number is going to be tiny, tiny, tiny. It's going to be two people from Zambia, one person from Nigeria, three people from Ghana, and we are trying to reach the Black community, the Black African community. So for us to do this practically, as we're thinking about, we need to be thinking about actually <laughs> the methods that we're using to reach uh, sort of people. I think. I was encouraged to see opt-out testing as, a, uh, as something which is a key part of the HIV commission. I think that will be a useful part um, because I think we've never actually had adequate uh, resourcing uh, for, 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 for Black Africans. Uh, it's never been adequate. I'll explain it in simple terms. Visualize it in this way for online tests, for example, to get one order from a gay man, you spend 50p in promotion to get one, one gay man to order. But to get an order from a black African person, you spend between 10 to 15 pounds to get one order. So the difference is, is, is huge. But the investment has always been like, we look at the numbers, we just give adequate sort of, uh, sort of equal numbers to some extent. We've not made adjustments for the higher cost of getting a result. Uh, like as, as we're going ahead. So um, as I'm looking ahead, I'm just thinking one of our challenges would be actually enabling ourselves uh, to think about how we resource things, uh, where we put those resources and make things actually sort of happen. But I am just leaving that challenge for you to think 380 last time from Black Africans. And remember that Black Africans are not just one sort of group, they're, they're so diverse. How do we resource it so that it's adequate? On the other part, like sort of, uh, sort of moving on from that, um, I think one of the things which is quite uh, exciting about the commitment to ending HIV by 20, new uh, HIV cases by 2030 is understanding that sort of um, the, the thing, the landscape has changed. Like uh, it's no longer a gay men's. I think Steve talk about, talked about it at the beginning. It's not a gay men's problem as was previously thought. Um, we, we have lots of heterosexuals, 
Now, every year, more heterosexuals who are not Black African get diagnosed with HIV than Black African heterosexuals. So <laughs> of all heterosexuals, you're looking at just about 40% being Black Africans who are diagnosed. And then you've got 60% who are not Black African. So as we go ahead, <laughs> it is hard for us to be uh, sort of uh, thinking, we have to put our heads together on how we, add, we, we react to the issue of the 60%, because we're trying to get 60% from a significant part of the, uh, uh, of the population of, the, uh, like, uh, of England. It's a much bigger pool to try to get this uh, very few people. So I think um, we need to really to be um, sort of referring to the things which are in the, um, uh, uh, in the recommendations from the HIV Commission around opt-out testing, uh, trying to put testing wherever possible. Um, there's so much to talk about in terms of actually some of the things to do with prevention. We will come to those. I think we have more time to have a chat together, but I just wanted to present some problems for you, for us to start off with. So I'll leave it there, Florence, for now, and then we'll join in the uh, further discussions. Thank you so much, Taka. And just again, it touched on both the points that Sean and Michelle highlighted <laughs> in terms of understanding our communities. If we don't understand our communities, we can't get them tested. So it's so important that we do have access to that data. We've got a range of pre-submitted questions, which I'll start off by asking our speakers to respond to, and then we'll open it up to some of the questions in the chat. So the first question we've got pre-submitted is from Hannah Bryan, and she's the health manager for Portsmouth City Council. So Hannah asks, what more should we be doing in commissioning to provide the increase and uptake of PrEP? So should we be looking at more education, promotion, and can we expect guidance to support this? I'll come to you first, Michelle, in terms of do you think there's any more we should be doing around that? Absolutely. Sorry, um, I do. And I think um, I know that, that just uh, lots of London services are very active. And I'm sorry if I'm not naming others outside of London, very active in promoting PrEP. And I know we are at Clinic Q, we promote it. We use images of good communities that we're reaching, trans people. Um, you know, to talk about PrEP and many people for trans people were on PrEP impact trial and continue now, now that it's uh, available on the NHS. And I think we need to make sure that all services who are delivering PrEP are reaching out in an advertising way and with images that relate to the community you're reaching out to. And I think it really needs to be, and I think we might have mentioned this, but anyway, not only does testing HIV testing need to be in outside of sexual health service as well. PrEP availability needs to be wherever we can get it into. So in GPs, in, in community centres, and awareness about PrEP. You know, a lot of people want pleasure over safety. Well, you can have condomless sex and pleasure, but still safety once you're on PrEP. So it really needs to, that's what I think we need to do anyway. Sean, is there anything you would add to that? Um, yeah, I'll probably come in here um, as a primary care clinician. Um, so working in general practice and sexual health, I think I would emphasise basically the need for greater accessibility, like Michelle said. So basically making PrEP available outside sexual health services. And I think we're really missing out on the thing here. Um, if you look at like the 2019 data, which is in the HIV Commission report about you know, who new diagnoses were made among what groups, what subpopulations, you know, we've got populations such as those who are born abroad, you know, does this population understand the health system when they move to the country? Do they know to go to a sexual health clinic? Are they more likely to register with the GP? We know over 60 million people are registered in general practice. How many of those are aware of PrEP? How many GPs are aware of PrEP? And I can tell you, not many, because we don't do PrEP, um, provision we don't give it out and we also don't do any monitoring so actually the knowledge amongst general practitioners is low and there's obviously loads of competing interest yeah. and secondly yeah. I think we're missing out on things like travel clinics um, so the report alluded to I think 15% of diagnoses in 2019 were acquired while traveling abroad well where are travel clinics they're not in sexual health clinics they're in general practice they're in the private sector and why are we not gearing up prep provision in those settings or making people aware of it can I just say absolutely spot on, Sean? And I've 
got a great GP practice, really are. They're just at the end of the road here. And I go in there with prep leaflets and all stuff. And I say, can you put these out? No, they never have. They put other stuff out. But really, if you can get GPs on board with that. No, anyway. Really good. Taku, so do we think that there's enough um, understanding within the Black African community and diverse communities around PrEP? Um, well, like uh, if anything, uh, the COVID vaccine will be a good uh, analogy that I want to use for people to think about. Just because something is there doesn't people doesn't mean people will use it. Yeah. So um, so just because we've got prep doesn't mean the Black African community, when they know about it, will use it. So. What, why, why, why I'm just highlighting this is just for us to spend more time in, in understanding, like for, for commissioners to spend more time in understanding that it's nearly like a hundred meter race and everyone is at a different meter sort of uh, point. So like um, when you compare with gay men, like uh, for many black African people, um, we're at the 20 meter point and gay men are already at 80 meters. So that race, we're never going to, to catch up in a way. So. Um, for commissioners, I think it would be useful to always think that each community will have different uh, needs when it comes to understanding or and choosing to use prep. So there's no one uh, there's no one blanket solution for every community. Every community has to be treated differently, and we need to invest more in terms of just general. Uh, our code treatment uh, uh, sort of um, literacy, because actually the problem for PrEP, like sometimes in Black African communities, is not a problem of PrEP. It's a problem of accepting that treatment fully works in the first place, because for you to accept uh, that PrEP would work for you, you have to be actually believing that treatment works. So um, there is lots of stigma around, um, uh, around HIV generally within the community. And um, some of it is founded on like, people's experiences, real uh -huh. experiences in the past. And um, it is quite a, a sort of a job that we have to keep on plugging all the time, but understand that we're at different levels. No, no, really, really important. So one of the new um, terminologies that's come up during COVID is vaccine hesitancy. So I think um, undoubtedly we need to make sure that once we do get PrEP roll out, we don't see that hesitancy amongst some of um, the communities that need to come forward and, and take it. I'll link this in then to another question from Natalie Daly, and she and she's the public health registrar for Birmingham's Children's Hospital. And she asks, how do we ensure that this remains a priority in the midst of the pandemic? So with everything that's going on with COVID-19, the pressures on the NHS, the fact that the NHS in some areas are being overwhelmed, pressures with the ambulance service, how do we ensure that this still stays on top of, of everyone's priority? Um, sure. Steve, have you got your hand up because you wanted to say something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just saying hello, I'm back, I'm back in the room. Oh, you're back? Okay, <laughs> we might, but, uh, we might I, heard, I literally that, arrived Steve. at the start of the questions. Yeah, no, I, I just, just want to, can I just add on the, on the prep thing? I mean, I, I think the commission heard very clearly first-hand evidence how violence, stigma, discrimination meant that it was very hard for the trans community particularly to be in control of their own sexual health. I, and I think, you know, Michelle's on the call. I think without organisations like Clinic U, trans take-up of the PrEP impact trial would have been very different. You know, and, that, and that should be considered with, within the rollout um, commissioning of PrEP. But I think I said in my opening remarks, didn't I, as well, about, you know, PrEP does need to be negotiated into GP core contract. You know, when I think about other examples around, you know, mental health, maternal health of, of, of mums, it wasn't until we negotiated it into the GP contract um, that, we, that we moved the dial. It, it, it's, just, it's just the way of the world. It's just the way primary care works. Uh, on, the, on the question about um, priority in the pandemic, I mean, look, you know, the government couldn't be clearer, I would suggest. I mean, I, I don't speak for the government anymore, unfortunately, but I don't think they could have been clearer that, that it is that. Um, and actually, just this Monday of this week, actually, they, they sort of kicked off the process of writing the, the HIV action plan. So, um, and Matt's made very clear his promise to to parliament that it will be done as soon as possible. So, look, I mean, if you're on the, if you're on the call and, you, you know, you've got an organisation that has something that you want to, to, to put forward for the action plan, read the commission's report first, because clearly if it's in that, then you know that that's being considered. But you know, if, if not, con contact THT and, um, and put forward stuff that you want to see on that 
agenda. It's a, it's a completely once in a decade opportunity. Um, in terms of, you know, how do we make it a priority? Well, I think it is, but I think basically you need um, you need your parliamentarians to to keep keep banging away, and that's that's what we do. That's that's mm-hmm. what we're paid to do. So you know, I think Florence, um, me, you, and Wes, what a team! Thank you, thank you very much, Sean. Sure. Right, yeah, so I, I mean, I mean, my answer to this question is basically it's up to us to ensure it remains a priority. I wish yeah. I had um, more of an answer than that, but I mean, I mean, it's up to each and every one of us. And I think you know, COVID has changed everything, and the future remains completely uncertain. But mm-hmm. the um, slightly biased view that I have is the probably the unprecedented speed with which you know people have embraced digital technology and the way people are accessing health and testing has changed dramatically. Like if we look at the Sexual Health London service that we are subcontracted to part manage at Lloyd's, the testing rates and the provision of remote treatment rocketed during lockdown, unsurprisingly. I just think we need to respond to these behaviors accordingly and embrace that trend towards digitization of services appropriately. Thank you. Taku. So like, I I, I think, it's going to be a, a sort of a tricky one. Like, um, so one of the important things for us at the moment is um, ensuring, for example, that community testing remains a priority, uh, like for black African population groups, because it's, it's a key part of the response, but you can't do it either <laughs> under the current uh, sort of circumstances. So it's one of the challenges that we've got where um, we're trying to ensure that we, we have to talk about it in a way, to keep on talking about it. That's the only way we can do it. We have to keep on talking about it um, because, yeah, there are some things we can't do which are required uh, like for the response, but we just have to keep on talking about it. And like um, already sort of mentioned by Sean as well, uh, trying to ensure that we make it as easy as possible for people uh, who are maybe moving on to digital, who might not have used digital as much before when they move on to digital to use the services in easy ways as well. Great, Michelle? Yeah, can I just say, um, you know, I know many people in such health services uh, who deliver such health and do, they do a fantastic job and often overwhelmed with the amount of people and work that they do, or that we do, you know, I include myself in that. Um, I just want to say, you know, for many trans people were very difficult to um, get them to be interested in PrEP and that has changed so much. However, when people visit some sexual health services, <clears throat> so say, take this scenario, a trans guy um, who has <clears throat> what I'm going to say um, here <clears throat> as a vagina and has front hole sex. So knowing the languages that people use, such as front hole sex, penetrative sex, without a condom, um, turns up at a sexual health service. So, oh, well, you know, um, you're not really at risk of picking up HIV. So you don't really need a test. Okay. Uh, no, that is really important. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Can, can I just say? I can try and get through some more questions um, for our speakers. Um, just, I've got another question from Darren Knight, who's the chief exec of George House Trust. And he says, what do you perceive to be the single biggest challenge in achieving an end to domestic HIV transmissions by 2030? Um, I'll start with you on that one, Michelle. I can, I'll come back to you, Steve. Could you repeat the question? I was just somewhere else in my head then. What do you perceive to be the biggest, single biggest challenge in ending domestic HIV transmission by 2030? I think we kind of talked about it, is reaching people outside of the, the demographic that do come to sexual health services, that do test, really, and who are not don't have that culture of awareness around HIV testing and it can mean historic things oh you know you're going to die if you come HIV positive and don't know about the treatments they might have heard about the treatments but do they really understand that and I think you can't expect communities who have not been involved or engaged uh, with before around awareness around HIV, uh, U equals U, that you know undetectable equal uh, untransmittable and PrEP to actually start testing because they might be carrying those tombstones from the H's still or the actual black that people 
die if they're HIV and they don't want to know. A lot of people don't want to get a test for COVID because they don't want to know about it. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge for me. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I mean, look, what did what did Dr. Tedros say at the start of the pandemic from the WHO? That it's test, test, test. And, you know, we very much have taken that mantra into our work. Michelle, absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I think... <laughs> To, to use the, the language of the day, you know, it is it is the way to find the asymptomatic sufferers. It is the only way to find the 5,900 or so people living in England who, are, who we think are undiagnosed with HIV. I mean, you know, even having been the public health minister for two and a bit years, you know, doing the commission, there are so many things I learned. I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone on this call knows this. I'm sure they say they did if they didn't. But, you know, the, the epidemic's changing. So... Yeah, that's 20, 2019, 1,700 gay bisexual men diagnosed with HIV. 1,560 heterosexuals in the same year. It, it is very likely in the next year or so that heterosexuals will be more likely to be diagnosed with HIV than, than gay bisexual men. And so, you know, we know that late diagnosis in my old, my old job as cancer minister is the, is the great killer. Well, late diagnosis is the big is the biggest problem in, in in heterosexual couples especially black african women and men and so therefore test 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 asymptomatic at touch points with the nhs um has to be has to be the the biggest challenge that we've got but it's also the opportunity it's just, it's almost so simple it's um it's ridiculous that we haven't done it till now but when you when you consider that you know we're just talking about what Michelle said about trans people again, you know, it wasn't until 2015 that there was actually a code within sexual health services to record people properly. Um, so, you know, that's that's how far. Can I just come. say, and still no data on STIs and trans people. Yeah, yeah, Maybe that's something that Steve and I could try and get the government to look at um, on, on on that really important data then. Um, I'll come to you, Sean, just on that in terms of quite briefly, what, what do you think would be the biggest challenge on that? Um, so it's probably kind of what I mentioned at the beginning. So for me, it's, it's what the report re um, refers to as the fragmentation of the health and care system. I think, you know, it's particularly around the accountability for delivery of testing and how tests are funded. It will only hinder efforts. Um, and I think that fragmentation not only serves as a barrier, but it actually entrenches and widens health inequality. So when we're looking at these subpopulations, um, it can only make things worse. And it also slows transformation, prevents innovation. And as the report states, you know, it calls for leadership, accountability, but also I feel most importantly, investment. And lastly, um, any thoughts on that, Taku? Um, I, I think I'll just bounce off what uh, Sean said. Um, at the moment, if you look at it, 500, just over 500 Black Africans are diagnosed across the country. If it's all, um, all the testing is happening at local level, you have to just distribute how many there are per local authority. The numbers get really small for each local authority to take it as a priority. So there is a need for, it is a national prob problem. There is a need for continued sort of uh, a, a national outlook on it. Um, additionally, as well, I think um, a point which was uh, raised by, by Steve around testing, um, we have to realize, we have to understand why is it that lots of Black African women are getting into uh, sexual health clinics, not being offered a test, and also declining a test as well. Why is it happening? Like, um, we, like um, we need to understand all those things. We know it's a problem. Um, sometimes the statistics that we've got are fantastic at telling us what is happening, but sometimes we're lacking the information to understand why things are happening so that we can actually respond uh, sort of in appropriate ways. Thank you. I'll take one more question from our pre-submitted ones before opening it to the chat. I know we've got quite a number of questions there. So this one's from Longritz um, Quadrema, who's the co-director of 4M Mentors Network, CIC. And he asks, how will grassroots community-based organisations be enabled as well as be enabled to be meaningfully involved in the process? So again, it's about not just talking to the groups who are already active in this, who are already know where to go for the information, but those grassroots community groups who are working with the people who we term hard to reach. Michelle. Well, you know, I, I keep giving the example of trans people and how we did that really, but really Clinic Q is not funded for our HIV work. We do it because it's a 
part of our remit, it's part of what we set down. And if we were funded, we could reach more and more people. Well, maybe not, but we do, uh, we do what we do. And I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. that. I think let's go to somebody else for that. I'll come to Steve. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think of the organisations that I worked with in office, you know, the NAT and THT are, they're effective national lobbying organisations, but they also have a very big reach. They have a big reach across community. They have big, big social media presence and they have a lot of, affiliated organizations um, very loosely so all around the country you know we i went with the commission to bristol um to it was one of our one of our site visits you know ian's reach is incredible and so and i think that yeah they're the they're the two and and the elton john foundation of course they're the they're the, the big organizations that, that are well known um and, and come up if you search hiv prevention but actually they are very well connected into lots of the grassroots organization. And if I know, um, if I know those, those teams as well as I think I do, then they will be doing their job, which is reaching out and making sure that, that plenty of smaller organizations have a chance to input into the, the plan that Matt kicked off this week on Monday. Thank you. I'll come yeah. to some of the, um, yeah. can I come in quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah quickly. Like I, I think basically like, um, it's a point which touches on this and broader things. I think with the way that things are, uh, more collaborative work needs to be done across everything that we do. So uh, that includes, um, when we're looking at, at, at HIV, that includes looking beyond even HIV uh, organizations. We need to be working with lots of community organizations which are maybe working with asylum seekers, which support people like in, around migration. We need to be looking at organizations which are just community organization, not to do with anything to do with HIV because I cannot see how we achieve some of our goals without um, the, the whole, uh, sort of effective engagement of, of community organizations, that would be impossible really. Great, I'll just take one question from the chat. There's one from Nicola Connor and she asks, is the government planning on recommending opt-out of HIV testing in GP practices and hospitals in low prevalence areas? Sean, do you think that would be a good idea? Um, yeah, I'll chip in on this. I mean, obviously, don't have the answers to whether the government's going to recommend it. But um, so obviously, I think this is probably off the back of the nice guidance, which states that kind of in medium and high prevalence areas, you know, opt out testing primary care should be encouraged. I think the evidence behind that um, has mainly come from, you know, the, the number of tests that you're doing at this phase in the epidemic, how likely are you to pick up, um, you know, the undiagnosed. And this is a real bugbear for me. So I'm going to say something quite contentious, but actually, I think it should be available across the whole of primary care. What If you look nationally um, at who's actually been able to roll out this NICE guidance, um, I'd like to say down in Brighton, we've come pretty close just before COVID kicked in. We were about to launch it in, in various uh, practices. But if you look nationally, I can probably guarantee you that there aren't many areas doing this routinely. So, you know, what, what would be the harm in rolling out this guidance to low prevalence areas? Um, because the uptake of it has been so poor to date. It can only result in increased testing, in my view, and diagnosing the undiagnosed, so I fully support it. Absolutely right, because let's face it, exactly the same with COVID. You, know, you can be in a low prevalence area, but you can move to a high prevalence area. <laughs> People move around. So you know, I think you're absolutely right. I, I thought that the question in the chat, um, Florence, was from GB Taylor about, you know, do you think younger people are not scared of the horror of AIDS? It's a really interesting question. You know, when I mentioned in my remarks about the horror of the Tombstone campaign back in, you know, when I was a schoolboy, it's a really interesting question. You know, are people, are people scared? I mean, they're certainly scared of the current pandemic. Um, the government was scared. We've scared the life out of you um, with it. I, I don't think we need to scare people anymore. I think we on on HIV. I think we need to. I think we need to support and test and test and test, and and that is going to require a, a difficult conversation around um, around the public health budgets in local authorities. Um, it's going to require a very difficult conversation about that. You know, we we had a very difficult settlement in 2010 and 2015, which um, which I had to live with. I didn't like it very much, um, but I but I've said publicly many times. I think it, that that's going to have to be looked at.
No, no, no. Yeah, just, can I just say, I absolutely agree with you, Steve. We do not need to scare people around HIV. Mm. We need education, information that reaches the people where they're at and understand, understandable that ed- education. No, it just creates prejudice and stigma. When Correct. Start, yeah. That's a- Correct. And that, that, and, that, and that has led us to, you know, if there's one word that came out through the commission's work it was stigma uh you know it is st- you know you st- you still have situations in the nhs where people you know double double glove um because they've got somebody somebody coming in is hiv and you know it's that, that it, it's in it's systemic um and and we don't need to we don't need to make that that worse but i i, I see gb taylor is nodding yeah, on our screen yeah. and uh, Ma- thank Matthew you for raising said Fair based campaigning only increases stigma and barriers to testing, and we actually have the opposite. So yeah. he speaks the truth, that Matthew Hodson. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like that is our problem at the moment. Actually, like uh, like within uh, quite a, uh, some sectors of the African community, there is that fear. What we're trying to actually overcome is moving away from that fear, so that people c- can feel comfortable about getting tested and accessing treatment. All right. I'm just mindful of time, so really, really short. I'm um, just closing remarks from our four speakers and I'll start in reverse order of our four speakers. So I'll come to you, Taku, very, very just short closing remarks. Well, like I I think um, it is quite an exciting uh, position we're in. We're seeing that it is possible. It is practically possible for us to do it. Uh, We hope that the commitments which are being made uh, will be seen through um, and also that everyone will remain engaged. Um, Like um, my, my hope is COVID hasn't sort of taken the eye uh, of uh, sort of the focus for people. Uh, like hopefully as, as we go ahead, we will continue to um, sort of to engage. But one thing that I would really like to emphasize, let's keep on engaging with the data um, because we have to be responding to the data. Like Steve already alluded to, uh, in a few years time, sort of gay men are going to be fewer, black Africans are going to, are going to be even less of a, a majority amongst heterosexuals. And then at that point, even, even though the challenge remains that the other uh, group is from a bigger part of the population, to really end HIV, we need to find a way to respond to those people who don't fall within uh, uh, sort of uh, gay and bisexual men or uh, black African heterosexuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taku. Michelle. Um, you know, the date 2030 really sharpens my mind of focus. And I think it's a bit like a deadline when you're doing something that you've got to reach. And I think, you know, like um, we, it can be done. It can be done. And it's not a one shop, one stop for everybody. We need to be very inventive in how we reach people so that we just don't keep rolling out the same messages all the time. And that's happened, let's face it, over years, slightly different with different images, but it's the same messages and the people... That's it. Thank you. Sean? Um, mine's pretty simple. So um, I just go back to this idea of one size doesn't fit all. We need to give people options and we need to unpack these subpopulations. Um, and the second thing is it comes down to each and every one of us. So that the report clearly states, you know, make every contact count. And I took that one step further at the beginning to say, look, we need to increase that contact and make every one of those contacts count. So don't lose your passion. We can do this. Um, we've got time, but, you know, um, it's it's going to take a concerted effort and um, the big I investment. And finally, Steve. Yeah, I, 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 let, let's just remember, you know, In 1986, the chief constable of Manchester Police said that homosexuals, drug addicts and prostitutes who had HIV and AIDS were swirling in a human cesspit of their own making. We have come a long way from that kind of nonsense. And, you know, when we launched the thing on World AIDS Day, I think it was a it was a moment of of celebration because because we got the policy, we got the plan. But, you know, let's just remember that, you know, World AIDS Day is, a, is there for a, a day of reflection and remembrance, as well as to refocus our action. And, you know, lo- lots of people on this call this evening have, have lost people that they love and that they know. Um, s- some, some of them unnecessarily because of the stigma that's attached to, to, to this condition. And then the fact is, for me, is that we have a chance. I think we have an opportunity here. Um, in the midst of a very dark time, and uh, you know what a what an opportunity! Um, you just we we can we can grab it if we test test test. 
Thank you very much. And thank you. And apologies to um, people in terms of not getting through your questions. But just to thank our four speakers this evening, I think a range of different issues in how we can continue to make sure this is a reality and a focus for everybody involved. And I think the key thing for me is about how we make sure that this is normalised in terms of discussions in schools, community groups, um, in, in the workplace. And there isn't that stigma attached to it. It's in all our interest to continue to push that agenda, making sure everyone is talking about it. Ending that stigma, we'll see more people coming forward to get tested. And with that test, 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 we can make it a reality to see zero transmissions by 2030. Thank you all for attending this evening and keep safe. Keep social distancing until we get out of this next pandemic. <laughs>